The Beastmen are, of course, best known for their colossal monster roster, with beasties of all shapes and sizes dominating the battlefield wherever they go. They also have a strong selection of melee troops to back these monsters up, making them nearly unstoppable once they get into melee. Combine this with their high speed across the board, and they can be a very sticky roster to go up against. Sadly, this playstyle of rush at the enemy at full speed tends to be their only viable choice since no other options are really available to them. This isn't helped by their lack of many ranged units, meaning they have to get up close and personal to do basically anything in combat. This also means they can be quite high on micromanagement since getting all of these units rushing into the right places at the right times can end up being a mammoth organisational task. Something else the Beastmen nail is a hearty meal before battle, but if the flesh of your enemies isn't to your taste, maybe try some Magic Spoon instead. After 160 years of stagnation, the cereal game has been completely reinvented by Magic Spoon, today's sponsor. It has all the taste of your favourite childhood cereal, but without any of the stuff that's bad for you. We're talking zero sugar, low carbs, only 140 calories, as well as being gluten, grain and soy free. It's even keto friendly with 13 grams of protein per serving, so those of you looking to get swole in the new year can pick this up for a tasty treat that won't ruin your gains. I'm sure you can tell, but 2023 is the year that I'm going to get jacked. With Magic Spoon in my corner, I'm going to get to that John Cena figure that I so desperately require. They sent me over their variety pack and you got Frosted, Fruity, Peanut Butter, and my favourite, Cocoa. Even makes a chocolate milk man, what else do you need? If you want to try them all out yourself, Magic Spoon are offering $5 off any order using Colonel D at checkout. And if you needed any other reason, they have a money back guarantee, so if you get it and you don't like it, you can send it back for any reason whatsoever. But I get a feeling that you're probably going to like it. So use that QR code on screen now, or head on over to magicspoon.com forward slash Colonel D and treat yourself to the taste of childhood. First up Lords, and we're starting with Kazrak 1M. Kazrak is your basic frontlines expert Lord with decent all around stats. He's tough, has pretty good melee stats and damage, but not much armor piercing. Use him like any other lord like this and get him into the middle of the front lines to do some damage to lower armor troops and keep nearby allied units encouraged. Don't let him get in too deep or get in a one-on-one -on -one duel with anything too elite, as his damage will not do enough to take out his target and keep him alive. Aim for those low armor targets without much armor piercing damage, and he'll do just fine. He also has a couple of mounts. The Tuscar Chariot drops his melee stats and overall weapon strength to gain a ton of speed, charge bonus and armor piercing with a bonus versus infantry. This makes him into a powerful single entity chariot that can do a lot of damage if you can handle the micro. The Razor Guard Chariot enhances the chariot experience even more, with even more weapon strength and charge bonus along with some improved melee stats. Still use it the same to constantly charge around for massive damage and avoid sustained combat at all costs as it is a death sentence for any chariot unit. Next up we have Malagor. Malagor fits most into the pure spellcast category when it comes to lords. His melee stats are fine and his damage is alright even without the armor piercing, but his armor is so pitifully low that any form of sustained combat against anything better than zombies and he's going to go down like a sack of taters with wings and horns. If he's going to take part in any combat, I'd use him to cycle charge to make the most of his charge bonus and primal fury passive. Keep him charging in and out constantly to get the most damage possible whilst giving spell support wherever needed. His mix of spells allows him to do pretty much anything with buffs, debuffs and damage and the ever powerful Saigor summon, so be sure to utilize everything he can for maximum value. Next up, Morgur. Morgur is slightly better in the front lines than Malgor, but not by much. He has better attack, leadership and charge bonus as well as poison attacks, but still shares that same terrible armor. He can't even fly, so he's a lot slower, meaning the cycle charging is a lot harder to pull off. Instead, I throw him into the front lines versus low damage foes to encourage nearby allied units and deal constant damage with his aura of vile transmutation. His regeneration should keep him topped up against any damage low tier units can throw at him, just keep an eye on him to make sure it doesn't get too deep or pulled into combat versus something more elite. And our final legendary lord is Torox the Brass Bull. I think it's pretty obvious how he's supposed to use Torox. He's a frontlines machine with massive armor piercing damage, near impenetrable armor and pretty great melee stats given they're also area attacks. Toss him into combat versus basically anything and he'll come out on top no matter if it's lords, infantry or monsters. The only thing you need to be careful of is being overwhelmed either by being surrounded by high armor piercing anti-large damage or missile fire. He does have some resistance but in a large enough volume and a special armor piercing he'll feel it and be in a world of hurt. Also, don't be afraid to use his mass and charge bonus to knock units around if needed. I like to send him around with a couple of units of minotaurs for a fast moving, high damage hit squad. First of our generic lords is the Beast Lord. These guys are basically the same as Kazrak but worse in every stat but melee attack. Use them the exact same but play even safer to keep them alive and encouraging nearby units. They even have the exact same two mountain options so they really are just discount Kazraks and function exactly like it. Next up the Great Bray Shamans. These are pure spellcasters with worse stats than Malagor in everything but leadership and armor. Avoid combat at pretty much all costs with these guys and just focus on spellcasting to get their value. They have a strong selection of lords to pick from so pick your favorites and make full use of it to get a ton of value. You can go Beasts, Death, Shadows or Wild. My recommendation would be either Shadows or Wild. Beasts is pretty good, Death is kind of mid. They have the same two mounts as the Beast Lord which allow them to take part in some charging based combat so once they're on either of these, use them the same with a ton of micro for a ton of value. Just always keep their spells in mind when doing this to ensure they can always cast where needed even whilst dealing charging damage. And our final Lord is the Doombull. 
These are essentially discount Torox with worse stats in everything but speed and leadership. You can use them pretty much the same, just exercising a bit more caution since they can't quite one-man armies easily right out the gate. Still, charge them into pretty much anything with a hit squad of Minotaurs and take out basically anything in the game that isn't elite anti-large. They're still great duelists too with their melee stats and damage, and you could even argue that they're a little better with their dazed infused attacks. Still, avoid the same stuff like getting surrounded in melee or focus on a range, and they should do just fine. Now come to our heroes. First up, we have the Wargore. These are fairly similar to Beast Lords, but a little worse in the damage department with a lot more armor and a silver shield making them tougher versus ranged. They can be used more or less the same in battle, focusing on low armor infantry to make the most of that bonus damage. Avoid letting them get into combat with anything more elite than this, or they'll start to struggle. The mounts are exactly the same as a Lord, so just using the exact same with a ton of micro, and they'll get great value. Next up, the Bray Shaman. Literally the exact same as the Lord version, but with less HP and leadership. Using exactly the same, sitting at the back casting whilst avoiding combat at all costs. The mounts are once again the exact same, and let them do some great damage at the cost of micro, so decide if you can handle it before upgrading, and always keep them in range of casting. The choice of laws is the same as before, so choose whichever you like best, and go wild. Not war of wilds, just go wild with whichever spell law you pick. And finally, we have the Gorbel. Once again, we have a hero that's more or less the same as a Lord, but a little worse in most stats. They'll do pretty much the same job, but be a little less impactful. Still, using the exact same, and you can't go wrong. Get hit squad together and take out anything you set your eyes on with ease, just not as much ease as a Lord. Now we come to the melee infantry. First up, the Ungor Spearman Herd. These are your standard early game line holder infantry, with mid melee stats for this stage of the game, and some charge reflect versus large. Use them to keep enemy units still, whilst other units like your Lord, Monsters or Missiles do all the damage. They won't pick up too many kills themselves, and won't stick around too long either with their low armor and leadership, but they're simply there to keep the enemy still and keep more important units safe, so that's just fine. They also have another variation, Shields. These guys get more defense than the Bronze Shield, so are marginally tougher versus most forms of damage. Still using the exact same toward the line, only now they'll enjoy being slightly tougher whilst doing so. The Ungor Herd swap the space for axes and drop a little defense in exchange for some attack, weapon strength and charge bonus. This still doesn't really change how you want to use them since their melee stats are pretty weak so they can't solo fight anything better than zombies. Still keep them supported with damage and have them hold enemies still and protect your troops rather than relying on them to do all the fighting. Next up we have Gore Herds with shields. These are a step up from the Ungor Herd in every stat but armor. They now have slightly better melee stats and weapon strength but are also no powerhouses of melee combat. For their stage of the game you'll still be using them as a line holder and bringing in other units to do all the damage for them. You'll still end up using them the exact same, but they're of course worth upgrades to keep you competing with enemy units at their stage of the game. They also have another variation, Unshielded Got Herd. Dropping the shields loses them quite a bit of defense, but gains them just as much attack alongside some damage and charge bonus. This makes them into a little more of a damage dealer as long as you're going up against low armor units. Against anything tougher, they'll still need support and you might as well just take the shields. I'd take a mix or just shields depending on the rest of your army to ensure you have something for every enemy you come up against. And finally, we have the best Got Herd. These are the most elite infantry in the Beastmen, and it's a massive step up to say the least. Coming from the Gore Herd, we have a huge boost to armor and armor piercing damage at the cost of some minus speed and melee reductions, as well as losing Vanguard deployments. They are powerhouse damage dealers in melee with that AP damage, so we'll cut through basically anything with ease. Giving them support from monsters, magic, and range will push over pretty much anything you come up against, so keep them with allied units for easy wins. The only things to look out for are armor piercing melee and ranged, since they have no shields and relatively low defense, so can easily take as much damage as they deal if you aren't careful. Next up we have ranged infantry, and we have the Ungor Raiders. These are the only missile infantry in the roster, and they're pretty naff. They're only marginally worse in melee than the Ungor Spearmen with less defense and leadership, but hilariously, more weapon strength. They also of course have range damage, if you can call it that. Their missiles will bounce off of the weakest armor, so focus their fire onto the lowest armor troops you can to ensure they punch through. Use them to support your early front lines units, and focus fire down key enemy targets to take them out as quickly as possible. Avoid friendly fire if you can by getting them an angle. They might have a curved firing arc, but with all the monsters in the roster, it can still be easy to friendly fire, so avoid this possibility whenever you can. And finally, keep them safe from any melee combat, as they simply will not survive versus basically anything. Now we come to the cavalry, and first up we have Centigors. These are a decent mid-game shock cab unit with decent charge bonus and great speed, but not the best melee stats and weapon strength. You want to get them around enemy lines and attack their vulnerable backlines units with repeated cycle charging to maximize their damage whilst avoiding letting them take too many hits. Against weaker range units, they'll probably be alright in sustained combat if you can't handle micro, but against anything that can fend itself, you'll have to use that cycle charging or their defense will just not hold up. Also, avoid letting them get picked apart by missiles. They might have shields, but they'll still go down fast under sustained fire. They have perfect vigor, so run around the entire battle, and they should stay safe and ready to charge. They also come in another variation, Great Weapons. These swap some melee stats and the shield for armor piercing damage. This makes them even worse in sustained combat with pitiful attack and defense stats, so cycle charging is even more important to get value out of them. The added armor piercing damage will make them even better at this, allow them to charge more armored foes and still deal some decent damage. Use them the same as the base unit, just stay much more on top of the micro to make sure they deal a ton of damage without taking too much. Next up we have the Tuscar Chariot. These are a little slower than the Centigals, but come with a ton more charge bonus weapon strength. Of course, you want to use them the same as any chariot unit, so that means high micro to keep them on the move at all times, charging in and out of enemy units to maximize their damage and keep them alive. 
Do not leave them in sustained combat, no matter what, as their low defense and large hitbox will mean they drop in seconds, even with their high armor. As long as they can charge out from wherever they charge into, they'll rack up a ton of kills and have an easy time doing it. We also have the Razor God Chariots. These gain improvements to every stat but speed of the Tusk Gauls, making them even more deadly. You want to use them literally exactly the same, but now they'll do even more damage. Don't be fooled by the improved armor and melee stats. No chariots ever wants to sit in sustained combat, so keep them on the move and charge at all times for the best reward for the lowest risk. Now we come to our missile cav and we have the Centigore throwing axes. These lose some melee stats and charge bonus from the melee version, but pick up their range damage to make up for it. This damage is low range but armor piercing, so will hit hard from a risky location. Of course they can fire whilst moving, so they make for excellent skirmishing units, especially with the perfect vigor. Alternatively, you can use them to flank the enemy front lines and fire into undefended backs of the melee troops for risk free damage. Whatever you do, avoid letting them get caught in melee, as they are pretty weak and will lose versus basically anything. Also, avoid letting them get picked apart by ranged. If you see enemy missiles inbound, use their vigor and keep them on the move at all times to avoid being an easy target. And finally, we come to the monsters and beasts. First up, we have Chaos Warhounds. These are a classic flanking monster, and if you've ever seen another Warhound unit, these are pretty much the same. They're super fast and can easily get around basically anything on the enemy force. This makes them great taking out backlines units, especially if you send them in two on one to wipe out foes as quickly as possible without them taking too much damage. They're also amazing at wiping out retreating units, so if you spot anything high value on the run, send them in to finish the job. Avoid letting them get into combat versus anything that can defend itself, as their melee stats really cannot stand up to most actual fighters. Stick to the back lines and retreating units, and they should have an easy time. They also have another variation, Poison Chaos Warhounds. Literally, just get poison attacks using the exact same, only now they'll poison their targets to be easier to take out. Next we have the Razor Gore Herd. These are quite a bit slower than the Chaos Warhounds, but bring a ton more armor piercing damage and charge bonus. This makes them much better versus armored forces, and lets you use them as sort of a shock cap if you really want to. That being said, they do have Rampage, so if you don't manage them perfectly and they take a bit of damage, they'll charge headlong at the nearest enemy units and more often than not get themselves killed. For the most part, it's safe to use them the same as your Warhounds and stick to back lines and only turn their attention to the front lines once they run out of other targets. Just make sure they aren't taking too much damage no matter what they do, and they should do great for you. Next up we have the Harpies. These work fairly similar to the Warhounds since they have great speed, especially with the flights, and can take out backlines in a moment if used right. I would stick to the two-on-one strategy I mentioned for the Warhounds and blitz enemy backlines units before moving on to other targets once they retreat. They are nowhere near as good at taking out retreating units as Warhounds. In fact, I would say they are bad at it, so once something starts to get away, change targets and keep them working. Avoid sending them against front lines and other units that can probably defend themselves as their low armor and leadership can spell a quick defeat, even with the moderately high defense. Next up, the Feral Manticore. This is a single entity monster that's a little bit faster than Harpies and gains improvements to every stat but defense, making it a powerful offensive monster that can munch on backlines for breakfast. It also comes with Rampage, so similar to the Razor God Herd, you want to keep an eye on it to check it doesn't get itself hurt, get out of control, and run itself into an early grave. Honestly, between this and the Harpies, it's a closer battle than you'd think. It has massive weapon damage, so it's great versus less armored single backlines targets, but versus ranged infantry, it won't be quite as quick since it'll only hit so many entities at once. You could always go for one of each for a mixed damage hit squad so you have something for every target enemies might bring. Whatever you do, just avoid anything with decent melee stats of its own to prevent rampage wherever you can. Next, Chaos Spawn. These are our first front lines monster units. You want to send them in alongside the front lines to bolster their damage and spread that poison to everything you can. They may not have much armor or armor piercing damage, but they will fight to the death and deal damage in an area when they strike, meaning no enemy unit is safe if they're close to these guys. As long as you get them into front lines combat and stick them into some infantry to keep them semi safe, you can't go too far wrong. To get the most out of them, try to target less armored and lower damage foes to make sure their damage gets through and they don't go down too fast. Also avoid letting them get focused down by enemy ranged as their large hitboxes can make them easy targets. Next up, Minotaurs. These have a little bit more armor than Chaos Spawn, as well as a nice chunk of speed and some armor piercing, at the cost of some overall weapon strength. This makes them viable for both front lines and flanking use. You can use them the exact same as Chaos Spawn inside the front lines, taking on pretty much anything, or you can use them as a pseudo cap to flank enemy lines and attack basically anything you want from this new angle. They'll munch ranged troops in seconds and will break even the toughest infantry with a devastating flank, so the choice really is yours. Try to focus on infantry if you can to make the most of their anti-infantry bonus. It's not much, but that bonus damage can add up over the course of a fight, so you might as well use it if you can. They'll also deal more damage the more kills they get, so try and feed them some easy units early to get them some added power as soon as possible. Just make sure you don't send them in alone as they still aren't the toughest and can still go down if they get focused either in melee or from a range. They also have a couple of variations. Shields gain armor, defense, and a silver shield at the cost of a small amount of charge bonus and the bonus versus infantry. I see no reason not to use these over the base version since they're essentially the same but tougher. Using the exact same just now enjoy them dying a lot slower. And we also have great weapons. These swap the anti-infantry for anti-large bonus and gain a little bit of charge bonus. This makes them into great cav hunters with that new bonus damage, slaughtering most enemy cav in seconds. Of course, they can still do all the same things that the base unit can, but if you have bonus damage, you might as well use it. 
You also do great versus any other large targets like enemy monsters or war machines, so target those whenever possible to make the most of their damage. I'd like to take a mix of these and shields to have some power on the front lines, and have these guys as pseudo cav in the late game. Next up we have the giants. I'm sick of telling you how much giants suck, so I imagine you're sick of hearing about it, so I'll try and keep it quick. They are big, fat pincushions. If you're going against an enemy with any ranged units at all, they'll go down in seconds. If there's no ranged, they can do decent in the front lines. So if you can clear the entire map of enemy ranged, then bring them in. Or bring one of the many other monster units that are less bothered by range and not have to worry half as much. Giants never make sense to me, and one in the Beastmen roster with all the other options perhaps makes the least sense of all. Don't use it. Next up we have the Saigor. These have a slightly worse melee prowess in most areas than the Giants, and are a similar size, so are they worse? No, because they have one massive thing that the Giants don't. These big rocks that they can sling around mostly the entire map that deal massive damage wherever they land. This makes them into awesome artillery pieces that can blow up clumps of enemies with ease. On top of this, if it runs out of ammo or otherwise finds itself in melee, it kicks just as much ass there too with a massive attack and damage stats. Yeah, their defense and armor isn't the best, but by the time they get into combat, they should be just cleaning up whatever's left anyway. Next up we have the Jabba Slife. These are scarily fast frontlines monsters with massive damage that's armor piercing, poison, magical, and has a bonus versus infantry. Add on top of this its abilities and you have a monster that can win the melee combat all on its own. Give it some infantry to back it up and keep it safe and it's game over before it's even started. Send them in alongside melee infantry and watch the enemy front lines melt. Target the toughest infantry you can find to make the most of their massive armor piercing damage and watch it melt, whatever you point out. The only things to look out for are it being surrounded by high damage as it doesn't have the most armor in the world and of course the bane of all large units, ranged focus. Avoid these two things as much as possible and it should be an easy dub. And our final unit is the Gorgon. The Gorgon is a monster hunting monster, which sounds weird, but it's actually pretty damn strong. It's still a great frontlines beast with massive melee stats and weapon strength, but it also comes with a bonus versus large, making it slaughter larger targets with ease. You can either use it on the front lines alongside infantry and simply target any large targets you come up against, or you can send it around to seek out enemy targets hiding in the back lines, since it also has pretty respectable speed. It doesn't matter if it's carve or other giant monsters like itself or war machines, it will clap the cheeks of basically anything large you put it up against. Add on top of this the fact that they regen HP when in melee, and they are pretty much unstoppable. Of course, avoid the usual high damage in melee or from a range, and other than that, they should do great no matter what you put them up against. Now we come to the Regiments of Renown. First up, the Destroyers of Drakwald. These gain poison attacks and increased defense. Blackhorn's Ravagers gain Stalk, Rowdy, and increased armor. Korok's Man Rippers gain Charge Reflect versus Large, increased defense and anti-large bonus damage at the cost of reduced attack, weapon strength, and charge bonus. The Sons of Goros gain Guardian and increased armor. The Grog Hooves of Wolf's Run gain poison attacks and missiles and replace Rowdy with Drunken Bravado. The Butchers of Kalkengard cause terror and have regeneration. The Eye of Morslib gains the Warp Gaze ability and magical attacks and ammo. The Vorbgland Broodmother replaces Spurting Bile Blood with Searing Bile Blood and replaces poison attacks with armor sundering. And the Blood Brood Behemoth gains the Mark of Corn and increased attack. Now when it comes to the army compositions, I'm going to be using the tier system that we have to make armies for tier 1, 2, and 3. Starting with tier 1. We're gonna go with the Doomble. I was always gonna have some combination of a fighter and spellcaster, and since the casters are more or less the same no matter if they're a lord or a hero, the Doomble is an easy pick for the lord. He'll be a great fighter right out of the gate, and if you pick up some skills from the yellow line, he can scale into the late game and still be a menace. For the front lines, we're gonna go with six Shielded Gore Herd. These are the tankiest line we have available to us at the moment, so we'll be our line holders and keep the enemy still, whilst everything else in the army does all the damage. We're gonna go with five Ungor Raiders. Yeah, they suck, but they're all a missile spot we can get at this stage of the game, so we're gonna have to bring a few to soften up enemies before the lines clash. Like I said earlier, keep them on a flank once lines are set to keep everything alive, and they should do okay as long as you target low armor troops. I'm going to go with four Poison Chaos Warhounds and four Razorgore Herd. So I'm going to go with a mix of these two fast-moving monsters. The Warhounds are going to focus on backlines, ranged units, and anything that's retreating. The Razorgores will go after any leftover ranged units once the Warhounds are in, as well as doing some charging into the backs of the melee lines. Yes, they might go on a rampage, but it's better happening near your melee troops than alone on the opposite corner of the map. Just manage them well and avoid rampage where possible, using them to cycle charge for maximum value. Coming to tier 2, still got our Doomble, we're now picking up a Brace Shaman of Wilds. I was torn between Wilds and Shadows, but I think for the novelty of the Beastmen, Wilds is a great choice for some great variety, as well as being super powerful with buffs, damage, and of course, the Saigor Summon. If you really want to, you could get a second cast and go Shadows, because it's also a really powerful lore. Still got the same front line as before, we could upgrade to the regular Gore Herd, but they lose a lot of defense, and I want my front line to be tanky, because the extra damage isn't really going to benefit us, especially because it's not super armor piercing. We're going to go with three Great Weapon Centigors. These are going to be our flanking cav that will charge into the backs of the enemy lines to break their melee troops as quickly as possible with some good old-fashioned hammer and anvil. We're also going to go with three Throwing at Centigors. These will work with the Great Weapons to focus on anything that they are using their missile power to soften enemy units up for a final charge to finish them off. Just manage their targets constantly to avoid any friendly fire as those axes can hurt you if they hit your own guys. And finally, we're going to go with four Harpies and two Feral Manticores. These are going to go around in groups of two Harpies and a Manticore to wipe out enemy ranged units in seconds. Just Use the Harpies to surround the units, then bring in the Manticore to finish them off. Do this to units one by one, and they'll break in moments. 
Yeah, we can't wipe out retreating units anymore, but causing everything to retreat in record time is just as good. Come to tier 3, still have our Doombull, we also still have our Bray Shaman of Wilds. You can get the Bray Shamans on Chariot Mounts later if you can handle the Micro, or if you just want more speed. But this does come at the cost of a slightly large hitbox, so you'll have to decide if that's worth it for you. Otherwise, just keep them at the back, same as usual, and just throw a spell spot wherever needed. But the front line is going to go with six Bestigors. These are a massive step up and will be tanky as well as highly damaging to basically anything you come up against. They're going to work with the monsters to wipe out enemy front lines as quickly as possible to put pressure on enemies as much as possible. We're going to go with three Shielded Minotaurs. These are going to work in the front lines to wipe out infantry units in moments with their massive damage. You can also use them as flanking monsters to charge into the backs of the front lines if you want, but either will work just fine. We're also going to go with three Great Weapons Minotaurs. These are going to hunt down enemy cav and take them out as soon as possible to keep your backline safe. If there's no more cav, then get them into the front lines against any large targets they can find to make the most of that bonus damage. We're also going to go with two Jabba Slives. These are going to get into the front lines along with the Minotaurs and the Bestigors. Don't be too fussy as long as they're not going against super high damage and large troops. They should clean up, especially alongside Minotaurs and Bestigors. We're going to go with two Gorgons to work with the Great Weapons Minotaurs to take out any particularly tough larger targets. Target the most deadly large unit you can find and send them in. As long as the coast is clear of a ton of ranged units or anti-large supports, they should be just fine. And finally, of course, we're going to have two Cygols. Finally, these lads will sit at the back of your lines and rain fire onto enemy clumps to make the most of their massive missile strength. If they manage to run out of ammo, just send them into the front lines to join the slaughter. Don't be too fussy since at this point, everything should be a pretty soft target. Try to keep them safe if you can. They can defend themselves, but of course, if you can keep them firing constantly, that is a much better use of their time. That's everything you need to know on how to play the Beastmen in battle, but if you want to know how to play the rest of the factions in Immortal Empires, check out this playlist to see all my faction guides.